Section 28 of the Arabian Nights Entertainments, Volume 3. Translated by Jonathan Scott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gillian Hendry. The Adventure of the Caliph Harun al Rashid. Part 5. The same night it happened that a fisherman, a neighbour, mending his nets, found a piece of lead wanting, and it being too late to buy any, as the shops were shut, and he must either fish that night or his family go without bread the next day, he called to his wife and bade her inquire among the neighbours for a piece. She went from door to door on both sides of the street, but could not get any, and returned to tell her husband her ill success. He asked her if she had been to several of their neighbours, naming them, and among the rest of my house. "'No, indeed,' said the wife. "'I have not been there. That was too far off. And if I had gone, do you think I should have found any? I know by experience they never have anything when one wants it.' "'No matter,' said the fisherman. "'You are an idle hussy. You must go there.' for though you have been there a hundred times before without getting anything, you may chance to obtain what we want now. You must go. The fisherman's wife went out grumbling, came and knocked at my door, and waked me out of a sound sleep. I asked her what she wanted. Hassan, said she, as loud as she could bawl, my husband wants a bit of lead to load his nets with, and if you have a piece, desires you to give it him. The piece of lead which Sa'ad had given me was so fresh in my memory, and had so lately dropped out of my clothes, that I could not forget it. I told my neighbour I had some, and if she would stay a moment, my wife should give it to her. Accordingly, my wife, who was wakened by the noise as well as myself, got up, and groping about where I directed her, found the lead, opened the door, and gave it to the fisherman's wife, who was so overjoyed that she promised my wife that in return for the kindness she did her and her husband, she would answer for him we should have the first cast of the nets. The fisherman was so much rejoiced to see the lead which he so little expected, that he much approved his wife's promise. He finished mending his nets, and went a-fishing two hours before day, according to custom. At the first throw he caught but one fish, about a yard long, and proportionable in thickness, but afterwards had a great many successful casts, though of all the fish he took none equalled the first in size. When the fisherman had done fishing he went home, where his first care was to think of me. I was extremely surprised, when at my work, to see him come to me with a large fish in his hand. Neighbour, said he, my wife promised you last night, in return for your kindness, whatever fish I could catch at my first throw, and I approved her promise. It pleased God to send me no more than this one for you, which, such as it is, I desire you to accept. I wish it had been better. Had he sent me my net full, they should all have been yours. Neighbour, said I, the bit of lead which I sent you was such a trifle that it ought not to be valued at so high a rate. Neighbours should assist each other in their little wants. I have done no more for you than I should have expected from you, had I been in your situation. Therefore, I would refuse your present, if I were not persuaded you gave it me freely, and that I should offend you. And since you will have it so, I take it, and return you my hearty thanks. After these civilities, I took the fish and carried it home to my wife. Here, said I, take this fish which the fisherman our neighbour has made me a present of, in return for the bit of lead he sent to us for last night. I believe it is all we can expect from the present Sa'ad made me yesterday, promising me that it would bring me good luck. And then I told her what had passed between the two friends. My wife was much startled to see so large a fish. What would you have me do with it? said she, our gridiron is only fit to broil small fish, and we have not a pot big enough to boil it. That is your business, answered I, 
Dress it as you will, I shall like it either way. I then went to my work again. In gutting the fish, my wife found a large diamond, which, when she washed it, she took for a piece of glass. Indeed, she had heard talk of diamonds, but if she had ever seen or handled any, she would not have known how to distinguish them. She gave it to the youngest of our children for a plaything, and his brothers and sisters handed it about from one to another, to admire its brightness and beauty. At night, when the lamp was lighted, and the children were still playing with the diamond, they perceived that it gave a light, when my wife, who was getting them their supper, stood between them and the lamp, upon which they snatched it from one another to try it, and the younger children fell a-crying that the elder would not let them have it long enough. But as a little matter amuses children, and makes them squabble and fall out, my wife and I took no notice of their noise, which presently ceased, when the bigger ones supped with us, and my wife had given the younger each their share. After supper the children got together again, and began to make the same noise. I then called to the eldest to know what was the matter, who told me it was about a piece of glass, which gave a light when his back was to the lamp. I bade him bring it to me, made the experiment myself, and it appeared so extraordinary that I asked my wife what it was. She told me it was a piece of glass, which she had found in gutting the fish. I thought no more than herself, but that it was a bit of glass. But I was resolved to make a farther experiment of it, and therefore bade my wife put the lamp in the chimney, which she did, and still found that the supposed piece of glass gave so great a light that we might see to go to bed without the lamp. So I put it out, and placed the bit of glass upon the chimney to light us. Look, said I, this is another advantage that Sa'ad's piece of lead procures us. It will spare us the expense of oil. When the children saw the lamp was put out, and the bit of glass supplied the place, they cried out so loud, and made so great a noise from astonishment, that it was enough to alarm the neighbourhood, and before my wife and I could quiet them, we were forced to make a greater noise, nor could we silence them till we had put them to bed, where, after talking a long while in their way about the wonderful light of a bit of glass, they fell asleep. After they were asleep, my wife and I went to bed by them, and next morning, without thinking any more of the glass, I went to my work as usual, which ought not to seem strange for such a man as I, who had never seen any diamonds, or if I had, never attended to their value. But before I proceed, I must tell your majesty that there was but a very slight partition wall between my house and my next neighbour's, who was a very rich Jew and a jeweller, and the chamber that he and his wife lay in joined to ours. They were both in bed, and the noise my children made awakened them. The next morning the jeweller's wife came to mine to complain of being disturbed out of their first sleep. Good neighbour Rachel! which was the Jew's wife's name, said my wife. I am very sorry for what happened, and hope you will excuse it. You know it was caused by the children, and they will laugh and cry for a trifle. Come in, and I will show you what was the occasion of the noise. The Jewess went in with her, and my wife, taking the diamond, for such it really was, and a very extraordinary one, out of the chimney, put it into her hands. See here, said she, it was this piece of glass that caused all the noise. And while the Jewess, who understood all sorts of precious stones, was examining the diamond with admiration, my wife told her how she found it in the fish's belly, and what happened. Indeed, Aisha, which was my wife's name, said the jeweller's wife, giving her the diamond again, I believe, as you do, it is a piece of glass, but as it is more beautiful than common glass, and I have just such another piece at home, I will buy it if you will sell it. The children, who heard them talking of selling their plaything, presently interrupted their conversation, crying and begging their mother not to part with it, who, to quiet them, promised she would not. 
the jewess being thus prevented in her intended swindling bargain by my children went away but first whispered my wife who followed her to the door if she had a mind to sell it not to show it to anybody without acquainting her the jew went out early in the morning to his shop in that part of the town where the jewellers sell their goods thither his wife followed and told him the discovery she had made she gave him an account of the size and weight of the diamond as nearly as she could guess also of its beauty water and lustre and particularly of the light which it gave in the night according to my wife's account which was the more credible as she was uninformed the jew sent his wife immediately to treat to offer her a trifle at first as she should think fit and then to raise her price by degrees but be sure to bring it cost what it would accordingly his wife came again to mine privately and asked her if she would take twenty pieces of gold for the piece of glass she had shown her my wife thinking the sum too considerable for a mere piece of glass as she had thought it would not make any bargain but told her she could not part with it till she had spoken to me in the meantime i came from my work to dinner as they were talking at the door my wife stopped me and asked if i would sell the piece of glass she had found in the fish's belly for twenty pieces of gold which her neighbour offered her i returned no answer but reflected immediately on the assurance with which saad in giving me the piece of lead told me it would make my fortune the jewess fancying that the low price she had offered was the reason i made no reply said i will give you fifty neighbour if that will do as soon as i found that she rose so suddenly from twenty to fifty i told her that i expected a great deal more well neighbour said she i will give you a hundred and that is so much i know not whether my husband will approve my offering it at this new advance i told her i would have a hundred thousand pieces of gold for it that i saw plainly that the diamond for such i now guessed it must be was worth a great deal more but to oblige her and her husband as they were neighbours i would limit myself to that price which i was determined to have and if they refused to give it other jewellers should have it who would give a great deal more the jewess confirmed me in this resolution by her eagerness to conclude a bargain and by coming up at several biddings to fifty thousand pieces which i refused i can offer you no more said she without my husband's consent he will be at home at night and i would beg the favour of you to let him see it which i promised at night when the jew came home his wife told him what she had done that she had got no forwarder with my wife or me that she offered and i had refused fifty thousand pieces of gold but that i had promised to stay till night at her request he observed the time when i left off work and came to me neighbour hassan said he i desire you would show me the diamond your wife showed to mine i brought him in and showed it to him and as it was very dark and my lamp was not lighted he knew instantly by the light the diamond gave and by the lustre it cast in my hand that his wife had given him a true account of it he looked at and admired it a long time well neighbour said he my wife tells me she offered you fifty thousand pieces of gold i will give you twenty thousand more neighbour said i your wife can tell you that i valued my diamond at a hundred thousand pieces and i will take nothing less he haggled a long time with me in hopes that i would make some abatement but finding at last that i was positive and for fear that i should show it to other jewellers as i certainly should have done he would not leave me till the bargain was concluded on my own terms he told me that he had not so much money at home but would pay it all to me on the morrow that very instant fetch two bags of a thousand pieces each as an earnest and the next day 
though I do not know how he raised the money, whether he borrowed it of his friends, or let some other jewellers into partnership with him, he brought me the sum we had agreed for at the time appointed, and I delivered to him the diamond. Having thus sold my diamond, and being rich, infinitely beyond my hopes, I thanked God for his bounty, and would have gone and thrown myself at Sa'ad's feet to express my gratitude, if I had known where he lived, as also at Sa'adi's, to whom I was first obliged, though his good intention had not the same success. Afterwards I thought of the use I ought to make of so considerable a sum. My wife, with the vanity natural to her sex, proposed immediately to buy rich clothes for herself and children, to purchase a house and furnish it handsomely. I told her we ought not to begin with such expenses. For, said I, money should only be spent so that it may produce a fund from which we may draw without its failing. This I intend and shall begin to-morrow. I spent all that day and the next in going to the people of my own trade, who worked as hard every day for their bread as I had done, and giving them money beforehand, engaged them to work for me in different sorts of rope-making, according to their skill and ability, with a promise not to make them wait for their money, but to pay them as soon as their work was done. By this means I engrossed almost all the business of Baghdad, and everybody was pleased with my exactness and punctual payment. As so great a number of workmen produced, as your majesty may judge, a large quantity of work, I hired warehouses in several parts of the town to hold my goods, and appointed over each a clerk, to sell both wholesale and retail, and by this economy received considerable profit and income. Afterwards, to unite my concerns in one spot, I bought a large house, which stood on a great deal of ground, but was ruinous, pulled it down, and built that your majesty saw yesterday, which, though it makes so great an appearance, consists for the most part of warehouses for my business, with apartments absolutely necessary for myself and family. Some time after I had left my old mean habitation, and removed to this, Sa'ad and Sa'adi, who had scarcely thought of me from the last time they had been with me, as they were one day walking together, and passing by our street, resolved to call upon me. But great was their surprise when they did not see me at work. They asked what was become of me, and if I was alive or dead. Their amazement was redoubled when they were told I was become a great manufacturer, and was no longer called plain Hassan, but Khawja Hassan al Hubao, and that I had built in a street, which was named to them, a house like a palace. The two friends went directly to the street, and in the way, as Sa'adi could not imagine that the bit of lead which Sa'ad had given me could have been the raising of my fortune, he said to him, I am overjoyed to have made Hassan's fortune but I cannot forgive the two lies he told me to get four hundred pieces instead of two, for I cannot attribute it to the piece of lead you gave him. So you think, replied Sa'ad, but so do not I. I do not see why you should do Khawja Hassan so much injustice as to take him for a liar. You must give me leave to believe that he told us the truth, disguised nothing from us that the piece of lead which I gave him is the cause of his prosperity, and you will find he will presently tell us so. During their discourse, the two friends came into the street where I lived, asked whereabouts my house stood, and being shown it, could hardly believe it to be mine. They knocked at the door, and my porter opened it, when Sa'adi, fearing to be guilty of rudeness in taking the house of a nobleman, for that he was inquiring after, said to the porter, We are informed that this is the house of Khawja Hassan al Hubau. Tell us if we are mistaken. You are very right, sir, said the porter, opening the door wider. It is the same. Come in, he is in the hall, 
and any of the slaves will point him out to you. I had no sooner set my eyes upon the two friends than I knew them. I rose from my seat, ran to them, and would have kissed the hem of their garments, but they would not suffer it, and embraced me. I invited them to a sofa made to hold four persons, which was placed full in view of my garden. I desired them to sit down, and they would have me take the place of honour. I assured them I had not forgotten that I was poor Hassan the rope-maker, nor the obligations I had to them. But, were this not the case, I knew the respect due to them, and begged them not to expose me. They sat down in the proper place, and I seated myself opposite to them. Then Sa'adi, addressing himself to me, said, Halja Hassan, I cannot express my joy to see you in the condition I wished you when I twice made you a present of two hundred pieces of gold, for I mean not to upbraid you, though I am persuaded that those four hundred pieces have made this wonderful change in your fortune, which I behold with pleasure. One thing only vexes me, which is that you should twice disguise the truth from me, pretending that your losses were the effect of misfortunes which now seem to me more than ever incredible. Was it not because, when we were together the last time, you had so little advanced your small income with the four hundred pieces of gold that you were ashamed to own it? I am willing to believe this, and wait to be confirmed in my opinion. Sa'ad heard this speech of Sa'adi's with impatience, not to see indignation, which he showed by casting down his eyes and shaking his head. He did not, however, interrupt him. When he had done, he said to him, Forgive me, Sa'adi, if I anticipate Khawja Hassan before he answers you, to tell you that I am vexed at your prepossession against his sincerity, and that you still persist in not believing the assurances he has already given you. I have told you before, and I repeat it once more, that I believe those two accidents which befell him upon his bare assertion, and whatever you may say, I am persuaded they are true. But let him speak himself, and say which of us does him justice. After this discourse of the two friends, I said, addressing myself to them both, Gentlemen, I should condemn myself to perpetual silence on the explanation you ask of me, if I were not certain the dispute you have had on my account cannot break that friendship which subsists between you. Therefore I will declare to you the truth, since you require it, and with the same sincerity as before. I then told them every circumstance your majesty has heard, without forgetting the least. All my protestations had no effect on Sa'adi, to cure him of his prejudice. Khalja Hassan, replied he, the adventure of the fish and diamond found in his belly appears to me as incredible as the vultures flying away with your turban and the exchange of the scouring earth. Be it as it may, I am equally convinced that you are no longer poor, but rich as I intended you should be, by my means, and I rejoice sincerely. As it grew late, they rose up to depart, when I stopped them and said, Gentlemen, there is one favour I have to ask. I beg of you not to refuse to do me the honour to stay and take a slight supper with me, also a bed to-night, and to-morrow I will carry you by water to a small country house, which I bought for the sake of the air, and we will return the same day on my horses. If Sa'ad has no business that calls him elsewhere, said Sa'adi, I consent. Sa'ad told him that nothing should prevent his enjoying his company. We have only to send a slave to my house, that we may not be waited for. I provided a slave, and while they were giving him their orders, I went and ordered supper. While it was getting ready, I showed my benefactors my house and all my offices, which they thought very extensive, considering my fortune. I call them both benefactors without distinction, 
because without Sa'adi, Sa'ad would never have given me the piece of lead, and without Sa'ad, Sa'adi would not have given me the four hundred pieces of gold. Then I brought them back again into the hall, where they asked me several questions about my concerns, and I gave them such answers as satisfied them. During this conversation, my servants came to tell me that supper was served up. I led them into another hall, where they admired the manner in which it was lighted, the furniture, and the entertainment I had provided. I regaled them also with a concert of vocal and instrumental music during the repast, and afterwards with a company of dancers and other entertainments, endeavouring as much as possible to show them my gratitude. The next morning, as we had agreed to set out early to enjoy the fresh air, we repaired to the riverside by sunrise, and went on board a pleasure boat, well carpeted, that waited for us, and in less than an hour and a half, with six good rowers and the stream, we arrived at my country house. When we went ashore, the two friends stopped to observe the beauty of the architecture of my house, and to admire its advantageous situation for prospects, which were neither too much limited nor too extensive, but such as made it very agreeable. I then conducted them into all the apartments, and showed them the outhouses and conveniences, with all which they were very well pleased. Afterwards we walked in the gardens, where what they were most struck with was a grove of orange and lemon trees, loaded with fruit and flowers, which were planted at equal distances, and watered by channels cut from a neighbouring stream. The close shade, the fragrant smell which perfumed the air, the soft murmurings of the water, the harmonious notes of an infinite number of birds, and many other agreeable circumstances, struck them in such a manner that they frequently stopped to express how much they were obliged to me for bringing them to so delightful a place and to congratulate me on my great acquisitions, with other compliments. I led them to the end of the grove, which was very long and broad, where I showed them a wood of large trees, which terminated my garden, and afterwards a summer-house, open to all sides, shaded by a clump of palm-trees, but not so as to injure the prospect. I then invited them to walk in, and repose themselves on a sofa covered with carpets and cushions. Two of my boys, whom I had sent into the country with a tutor for the air, had gone just then into the wood, and seeing a nest which was built in the branches of a lofty tree, they attempted to get at it. But as they had neither strength nor skill to accomplish their object, they showed it to the slave who waited on them, and bade him climb the tree for it. The slave, when he came to it, was much surprised to find it composed of a turban. However, he took it, brought it down, and showed it to my children, and as he thought that I might like to see a nest that was so uncommon, he gave it to the eldest boy to bring to me. I saw the children at a distance coming back to us, overjoyed to have procured a nest. Father, said the eldest, we have found a nest in a turban. The two friends and I were very much surprised at the novelty, but I much more when I recognised the turban to be that which the vulture had flown away with. After I had examined it well and turned it about, I said to my guests, Gentlemen, have you memories good enough to remember the turban I had on the day you did me the honour first to speak to me? I do not think, said Sa'ad, that either my friend or I gave any attention to it, but if the hundred and ninety pieces of gold are in it, we cannot doubt of it. Sir, replied I, there is no doubt but it is the same turban, for besides that I know it perfectly well, I feel by the weight it is too heavy to be any other, and you will perceive this if you give yourself the trouble to take it in your hand. Then, after taking out the birds and giving them to the children, I put it into his hands, and he gave it to Sa'adi. Indeed, said Sa'adi, I believe it to be your turban, which I shall, however, be better convinced of when I see the hundred and ninety pieces of gold. Now, sir, said I, taking the turban again, observe well before I unwrap it, 
that it is of no very fresh date in the tree, and the state in which you see it, and the nest so neatly made in it, without having been touched by the hand of man, are sufficient proofs that the vulture dropped or laid it in the tree upon the day it was seized, and that the branches hindered it from falling to the ground. Excuse my making this remark, since it concerns me so much to remove all suspicions of fraud. Sa'ad backed me in what I urged, and said, Sa'adi, this regards you and not me, for I am verily persuaded that Khawja Hassan does not impose upon us. While Sa'ad was talking, I pulled off the linen cloth which was wrapped about the cap of the turban, and took out the purse which Sa'adi knew to be the same he had given me. I emptied it on the carpet before them, and said, There, gentlemen, there is the money, count it, and see if it be right. Which Sa'ad did, and found it to be one hundred and ninety pieces of gold. Then Sa'adi, who could not deny so manifest a truth, addressing himself to me, said, I agree, Khawja Hassan, that this money could not serve to enrich you, but the other hundred and ninety pieces, which you would make me believe you hid in a pot of bran, might. Sir, answered I, I have told you the truth in regard to both sums. You would not have me retract to make myself a liar. Khalja Hassan, said Sa'ad, leave Sa'adi to his own opinion. I consent with all my heart that he believes you are obliged to him for one part of your good fortune, by means of the last sum he gave you, provided he will agree that I contributed to the other half by the bit of lead, and will not pretend to dispute the valuable diamond found in the fish's belly. I agree to it, answered Sa'adi, but still you must give me liberty to believe that money is not to be amassed without money. What, replied Sa'ad, if chance should throw a diamond in my way worth fifty thousand pieces of gold, and I should have that sum given me for it, can it be said I got that sum by money? They disputed no farther at this time. We rose and went into the house, just as dinner was serving up. After dinner, I left my guests together, to pass away the heat of the day more at their liberty, and with great composure, while I went to give orders to my housekeeper and gardener. Afterwards, I returned to them again, and we talked of indifferent matters till it grew a little cooler, when we returned into the garden for fresh air, and stayed till sunset. We then mounted on horseback, and got to Baghdad by moonlight, two hours after, followed by one of my slaves. It happened, I know not by what negligence of my servants, that we were then out of grain for the horses, and the storehouses were all shut up, when one of my slaves, seeking about the neighbourhood for some, met with a pot of bran in a shop, bought the bran, and brought the pot along with him, promising to carry it back again the next day. The slave emptied the bran, and, dividing it with his hands among the horses, felt a linen cloth tied up and very heavy. He brought the cloth to me in the condition that he found it, and presented it to me, telling me that it might perhaps be the cloth he had often heard me talk of among my friends. Overjoyed, I said to my two benefactors, "'Gentlemen, it has pleased God that you should not part from me without being fully convinced of the truth of what I have assured you. There are the other hundred and ninety pieces of gold which you gave me,' continued I, addressing myself to Sa'adi. "'I know it well by the cloth, which I tied up with my own hands.' And then I told out the money before them. I ordered the pot to be brought to me, knew it to be the same, and sent my wife to ask if she recognised it ordering them to say nothing to her of what had happened. She knew it immediately, and sent me word that it was the same pot she had exchanged, full of bran, for the scouring earth. Sa'adi readily submitted, renounced his incredulity, and said to Sa'ad, I yield to you, and acknowledge that money is not always the means of becoming rich. When Sa'adi had spoken, I said to him, I dare not propose to return you the three hundred and eighty pieces of gold which it hath pleased God should be found, 
to undeceive you as to the opinion of my honesty. I am persuaded that you did not give them to me with an intention that I should return them, but, as I ought to be content with what Providence has sent me from other quarters, and I do not design to make use of them, if you approve of my proposal, to-morrow I will give them to the poor, that God may bless us both. The two friends lay at my house that night also, and next day, after embracing me, returned home, well pleased with the reception I had given them, and to find I did not make an improper use of the riches heaven had blessed me with. I thanked them both, and regarded the permission they gave me to cultivate their friendship, and to visit them, as a great honour. The caliph was so attentive to Khalja Hassan's story, that he had not perceived the end of it, but by his silence. Khalja Hassan, said he, I have not for a long time heard anything that has given me so much pleasure as having been informed of the wonderful ways by which God gave thee thy riches to make thee happy in this world. Thou oughtest to continue to return him thanks by the good use thou makest of his blessings. I am glad I can tell thee that the same diamond which made thy fortune is now in my treasury, and I am happy to learn how it came there. But because there may remain in Sa'adi some doubts on the singularity of this diamond, which I esteem the most precious and valuable jewel I possess, I would have you carry it with Sa'ad to my treasurer, who shall show it them, to remove Sa'adi's unbelief, and to let him see that money is not the only means of making a poor man rich in a short time, without labour. I would also have you tell the keeper of my treasury this story, that he may have it put into writing, and that it may be kept with the diamond. After these words, the caliph signified to Khalja Hassan, Syed Nalma'on, and Baba Abdullah, by bowing of his head, that he was satisfied with them. They all took their leave by prostrating themselves at the throne, and then retired. End of section 28section twenty nine of the arabian nights entertainments volume three translated by jonathan scott this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by gillian hendry the story of ali baba and the forty robbers destroyed by a slave part one in a town in persia there lived two brothers one named cassim the other ali baba their father left them scarcely anything, but, as he had divided his little property equally between them, it should seem their fortune ought to have been equal, but chance determined otherwise. Cassim married a wife who soon after became heiress to a large sum and a warehouse full of rich goods, so that he all at once became one of the richest and most considerable merchants, and lived at his ease. Ali Baba, on the other hand, who had married a woman as poor as himself, lived in a very wretched habitation, and had no other means to maintain his wife and children but his daily labour of cutting wood, and bringing it upon three asses, which were his whole substance, to town to sell. One day, when Ali Baba was in the forest, and had just cut wood enough to load his asses, he saw at a distance a great cloud of dust which seemed to be driven towards him. He observed it very attentively, and distinguished soon after a body of horse. Though there had been no rumour of robbers in that country, Ali Baba began to think that they might prove such, and without considering what might become of his asses, was resolved to save himself. He climbed up a large thick tree, whose branches, at a little distance from the ground, were so close to one another that there was but little space between them. He placed himself in the middle, from whence he could see all that passed, without being discovered, and the tree stood at the base of a single rock, so steep and craggy that nobody could climb up it. The troop, who were all well mounted and armed, came to the foot of this rock, and there dismounted. Ali Baba counted forty of them, and from their looks and equipage, was assured that they were robbers. 
nor was he mistaken in his opinion, for they were a troop of banditti, who, without doing any harm to the neighbourhood, robbed at a distance, and made that place their rendezvous. But what confirmed him in his opinion was that every man unbridled his horse, tied him to some shrub, and hung about his neck a bag of corn which they brought behind them. Then each of them took his saddle wallet, which seemed to Ali Baba to be full of gold and silver from its weight. One, who was the most personable amongst them, and whom he took to be their captain, came with his wallet on his back under the tree in which Ali Baba was concealed, and making his way through some shrubs, pronounced these words so distinctly, Open sesame, that Ali Baba heard him. As soon as the captain of the robbers had uttered these words, a door opened in the rock, and after he had made all his troop enter before him, he followed them, when the door shut again of itself. The robbers stayed some time within the rock, and Ali Baba, who feared that some one, or all of them together, might come out and catch him, if he should endeavour to make his escape, was obliged to sit patiently in the tree. He was nevertheless tempted to get down, mount one of their horses, and lead another, driving his asses before him with all the haste he could to town. But the uncertainty of the event made him choose the safest course. At last the door opened again, and the forty robbers came out. As the captain went in last, he came out first, and stood to see them all pass by him. When Ali Baba heard him make the door close by pronouncing these words, Shut sesame! Every man went and bridled his horse, fastened his wallet, and mounted again. And when the captain saw them all ready, he put himself at their head, and they returned the way they had come. Ali Baba did not immediately quit his tree, for, said he to himself, they may have forgotten something, and may come back again, and then I shall be taken. He followed them with his eyes, as far as he could see them, and afterwards stayed a considerable time before he descended. Remembering the words the captain of the robbers used to cause the door to open and shut, he had the curiosity to try if his pronouncing them would have the same effect. Accordingly, he went among the shrubs, and perceiving the door concealed behind them, stood before it and said, Open sesame! The door instantly flew wide open. Ali Baba, who expected a dark dismal cavern, was surprised to see it well lighted and spacious, in form of a vault, which received the light from an opening at the top of the rock. He saw all sorts of provisions, rich bales of silk, stuff, brocade, and valuable carpeting, piled upon one another, gold and silver ingots in great heaps, and money in bags. The sight of all these riches made him suppose that this cave must have been occupied for ages by robbers who had succeeded one another. Ali Baba did not stand long to consider what he should do, but went immediately into the cave, and as soon as he had entered, the door shut of itself. But this did not disturb him, because he knew the secret to open it again. He never regarded the silver, but made the best use of his time in carrying out as much of the gold coin, which was in bags, at several times, as he thought his three asses could carry. He collected his asses, which were dispersed, and when he had loaded them with the bags, laid wood over in such a manner that they could not be seen. When he had done, he stood before the door, and pronouncing the words, Shut sesame! The door closed after him, for it had shut off itself while he was within, but remained open while he was out. He then made the best of his way to town. When Ali Baba got home, he drove his asses into a little yard, shut the gates very carefully, threw off the wood that covered the bags, carried them into his house, and ranged them in order before his wife, who sat on a sofa. His wife handled the bags, and finding them full of money, suspected that her husband had been robbing, insomuch that she could not help saying, Ali Baba, 
Have you been so unhappy as to... Be quiet, wife, interrupted Ali Baba. Do not frighten yourself. I am no robber, unless he may be one who steals from robbers. You will no longer entertain an ill opinion of me when I shall tell you my good fortune. He then emptied the bags, which raised such a great heap of gold as dazzled his wife's eyes, and when he had done, told her the whole adventure from beginning to end, and above all, recommended her to keep it secret. The wife, cured of her fears, rejoiced with her husband at their good fortune, and would count all the gold piece by piece. Wife, replied Ali Baba, you do not know what you undertake when you pretend to count the money. You will never have done. I will dig a hole and bury it. There is no time to be lost. You are in the right, husband, replied she. But let us know, as nigh as possible, how much we have. I will borrow a small measure in the neighbourhood and measure it while you dig the hole. What you are going to do is to no purpose, wife, said Ali Baba. If you would take my advice, you had better let it alone, but keep the secret and do what you please. Away the wife ran to her brother-in-law, Cassim, who lived just by, but was not then at home, and addressing herself to his wife, desired her to lend her a measure for a little while. Her sister-in-law asked her whether she would have a great or a small one. The other asked for a small one. She bade her stay a little, and she would readily fetch one. The sister-in-law did so, but as she knew Ali Baba's poverty, she was curious to know what sort of grain his wife wanted to measure, and artfully putting some suet at the bottom of the measure, brought it to her with an excuse that she was sorry that she had made her stay so long, but that she could not find it sooner. Ali Baba's wife went home, set the measure upon the heap of gold, filled it and emptied it often upon the sofa, till she had done, when she was very well satisfied to find the number of measures amounted to so many as they did, and went to tell her husband, who had almost finished digging the hole. While Ali Baba was burying the gold, his wife, to show her exactness and diligence to her sister-in-law, carried the measure back again, but without taking notice that a piece of gold had stuck to the bottom. Sister, said she, giving it to her again, you see that I have not kept your measure long. I am obliged to you for it, and return it with thanks. As soon as Ali Baba's wife was gone, Cassim's looked at the bottom of the measure, and was in inexpressible surprise to find a piece of gold stuck to it. Envy immediately possessed her breast. What? said she. Has Ali Baba gold so plentiful as to measure it? Where has that poor wretch got all this wealth? Cassim, her husband, was not at home, but at his counting-house, which he left always in the evening. His wife waited for him, and thought the time an age, so great was her impatience to tell him the circumstance at which she guessed he would be as much surprised as herself. When Cassim came home, his wife said to him, Cassim, I know you think yourself rich, but you are much mistaken. Ali Baba is infinitely richer than you. He does not count his money, but measures it. Cassim desired her to explain the riddle, which she did, by telling him the stratagem she had used to make the discovery, and showed him the piece of money, which was so old that they could not tell in what prince's reign it was coined. Cassim, instead of being pleased, conceived a base envy at his brother's prosperity. He could not sleep all that night, and went to him in the morning before sunrise. Cassim, after he had married the rich widow, had never treated Ali Baba as a brother, but neglected him. Ali Baba, said he, accosting him, you are very reserved in your affairs. You pretend to be miserably poor, and yet you measure gold. How, brother? replied Ali Baba. I do not know what you mean. Explain yourself. Do not pretend ignorance, replied Cassim, showing him the piece of gold his wife had given him. How many of these pieces, added he, have you? My wife found this at the bottom of the measure you borrowed yesterday. 
By this discourse, Ali Baba perceived that Cassim and his wife, through his own wife's folly, knew what they had so much reason to conceal, but what was done could not be recalled. Therefore, without showing the least surprise or trouble, he confessed all, told his brother by what chance he had discovered this retreat of the thieves, in what place it was, and offered him part of his treasure to keep the secret. "'I expect as much,' replied Cassim haughtily. "'But I must know exactly where this treasure is, and how I may visit it myself when I choose. Otherwise I will go and inform against you, and then you will not only get no more, but will lose all you have, and I shall have a share for my information.' Ali Baba, more out of his natural good temper than frightened by the insulting menaces of his unnatural brother, told him all he desired, and even the very words he was to use to gain admission into the cave. Cassim, who wanted no more of Ali Baba, left him, resolving to be beforehand with him, and hoping to get all the treasure to himself. He rose the next morning long before the sun, and set out for the forest with ten mules bearing great chests, which he designed to fill, and followed the road which Ali Baba had pointed out to him. He was not long before he reached the rock, and found out the place by the tree, and other marks which his brother had given him. When he reached the entrance of the cavern, he pronounced the words, Open sesame! The door immediately opened, and when he was in, closed upon him. In examining the cave, he was in great admiration to find much more riches than he had apprehended from Ali Baba's relation. He was so covetous and greedy of wealth that he could have spent the whole day in feasting his eyes with so much treasure, if the thought that he came to carry some away had not hindered him. He laid as many bags of gold as he could carry at the door of the cavern, but his thoughts were so full of the great riches he should possess that he could not think of the necessary word to make it open, but instead of sesame said, Open barley, and was much amazed to find that the door remained fast shut. He named several sorts of grain, but still the door would not open. Cassim had never expected such an incident, and was so alarmed at the danger he was in, that the more he endeavoured to remember the word sesame, the more his memory was confounded and he had as much forgotten it as if he had never heard it mentioned. He threw down the bags he had loaded himself with, and walked distractedly up and down the cave, without having the least regard to the riches that were around him. About noon the robbers chanced to visit their cave, and at some distance from it saw Cassim's mules straggling about the rock, with great chests on their backs. Alarmed at this novelty, they galloped full speed to the cave. They drove away the mules, which Cassim had neglected to fasten, and they strayed through the forest so far that they were soon out of sight. The robbers never gave themselves the trouble to pursue them, being more concerned to know who they belonged to, and while some of them searched about the rock, the captain and the rest went directly to the door, with their naked sabres in their hands, and pronouncing the proper words, it opened. Cassim, who heard the noise of the horse's feet from the middle of the cave, never doubted of the arrival of the robbers and his approaching death, but was resolved to make one effort to escape from them. To this end he rushed to the door, and no sooner heard the word sesame, which he had forgotten, and saw the door open, than he ran out and threw the leader down, but could not escape the other robbers who, with their sabres, soon deprived him of life. The first care of the robbers after this was to examine the cave. They found all the bags which Cassim had brought to the door to be ready to load his mules, and carried them again to their places, without missing what Ali Baba had taken away before. Then, holding a council, and deliberating upon this occurrence, they guessed that Cassim, when he was in, could not get out again, but could not imagine how he had entered. It came into their heads that he might have got down by the top of the cave, but the aperture by which it received light was so high, and the rock so inaccessible without, 
besides that nothing showed that he had done so, that they gave up this conjecture. That he came in at the door they could not believe, however, unless he had the secret of making it open. In short, none of them could imagine which way he had entered, for they were all persuaded nobody knew their secret, little imagining that Ali Baba had watched them. It was a matter of the greatest importance to them to secure their riches. They agreed, therefore, to cut Cassim's body into four quarters, to hang two on one side and two on the other within the door of the cave, to terrify any person who should attempt the same thing, determining not to return to the cave till the stench of the body was completely exhaled. They had no sooner taken this resolution than they put it in execution, and when they had nothing more to detain them, left the place of their hordes well closed. They mounted their horses, went to beat the roads again, and to attack the caravans they might meet. In the meantime, Cassim's wife was very uneasy when night came, and her husband was not returned. She ran to Ali Baba in alarm, and said, I believe, brother-in-law, that you know Cassim, your brother, is gone to the forest, and upon what account? It is now night, and he is not returned. I am afraid some misfortune has happened to him. Ali Baba, who had expected that his brother, after what he had said, would go to the forest, had declined going himself that day, for fear of giving him any umbrage therefore told her, without any reflection upon her husband's unhandsome behaviour, that she need not frighten herself, for that certainly Cassim would not think it proper to come into the town till the night should be pretty far advanced. Cassim's wife, considering how much it concerned her husband to keep the business secret, was the more easily persuaded to believe her brother-in-law. She went home again and waited patiently till midnight, then her fear redoubled and her grief was the more sensible because she was forced to keep it to herself. She repented of her foolish curiosity, and cursed her desire of penetrating into the affairs of her brother and sister-in-law. She spent all the night in weeping, and as soon as it was day went to them, telling them, by her tears, the cause of her coming. Ali Baba did not wait for his sister-in-law to desire him to go to see what was become of Cassim but departed immediately with his three asses, begging of her first to moderate her affliction. He went to the forest, and when he came near the rock, having seen neither his brother nor the mules in his way, was seriously alarmed at finding some blood spilt near the door, which he took for an ill omen. But when he had pronounced the word, and the door had opened, he was struck with horror, at the dismal sight of his brother's quarters. He was not long in determining how he should pay the last dues to his brother, but without adverting to the little fraternal affection he had shown for him, went into the cave to find something to enshroud his remains, and having loaded one of his asses with them, covered them over with wood. The other two asses he loaded with bags of gold, covering them with wood also as before and then bidding the door shut, came away, but was so cautious as to stop some time at the end of the forest, that he might not go into the town before night. When he came home, he drove the two asses loaded with gold into his little yard, and left the care of unloading them to his wife, while he led the other to his sister-in-law's house. Ali Baba knocked at the door, which was opened by Morgiana, an intelligent slave, fruitful in inventions to ensure success in the most difficult undertakings, and Ali Baba knew her to be such. When he came into the court, he unloaded the ass, and, taking Morgiana aside, said to her, The first thing I ask of you is an inviolable secrecy, which you will find is necessary both for your mistress's sake and mine. Your master's body is contained in these two bundles, and our business is to bury him as if he had died a natural death. Go tell your mistress I want to speak with her, and mind what I have said to you. Morgiana went to her mistress, and Ali Baba followed her. Well, brother, said she with great impatience, what news do you bring me of my husband? I perceive no comfort in your countenance. 
"'Sister,' answered Ali Baba, "'I cannot satisfy your inquiries "'unless you hear my story from the beginning to the end "'without speaking a word, "'for it is of as great importance to you as to me "'to keep what has happened secret.' alas said she this preamble lets me know that my husband is not to be found but at the same time i know the necessity of the secrecy you require and i must constrain myself say on i will hear you ali baba then detailed the incidents of his journey till he came to the finding of cassim's body now said he sister i have something to relate which will afflict you the more because it is perhaps what you so little expect. But it cannot now be remedied. If my endeavours can comfort you, I offer to put that which God hath sent me to what you have, and marry you, assuring you that my wife will not be jealous, and that we shall live happily together. If this proposal is agreeable to you, we must think of acting so as that my brother should appear to have died a natural death. I think you may leave the management of the business to Morgiana, and I will contribute all that lies in my power to your consolation. What could Cassim's widow do better than accept of this proposal? For though her first husband had left behind him a plentiful substance, his brother was now much richer, and by the discovery of this treasure might be still more so. Instead, therefore, of rejecting the offer, she regarded it as the sure means of comfort, and, drying up her tears, which had begun to flow abundantly, and suppressing the outcries usual with women who have lost their husbands, showed Ali Baba that she approved of his proposal. Ali Baba left the widow, recommended to Morgiana to act her part well, and then returned home with his ass. Morgiana went out at the same time to an apothecary, and asked for a sort of lozenges, which he prepared, and were very efficacious in the most dangerous disorders. The apothecary inquired who was ill at her master's. She replied with a sigh, her good master, Cassim himself, that they knew not what his disorder was, but that he could neither eat nor speak. After these words, Morgiana carried the lozenges home with her, and the next morning went to the same apothecaries again, and with tears in her eyes asked for an essence which they used to give to sick people only when at the last extremity. Alas, said she, taking it from the apothecary, I am afraid that this remedy will have no better effect than the lozenges, and that I shall lose my good master. On the other hand, as Ali Baba and his wife were often seen to go between Cassim's and their own house all that day, and to seem melancholy, nobody was surprised in the evening to hear the lamentable shrieks and cries of Cassim's wife and Morgiana, who gave out everywhere that her master was dead. End of section 29 Section 30 of the Arabian Nights Entertainments, Volume 3, translated by Jonathan Scott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gillian Hendry. The Story of Ali Baba and the Forty Robbers Destroyed by a Slave, Part 2. The next morning, soon after day appeared, Morgiana, who knew a certain old cobbler that opened his stall early before other people, went to him and, bidding him good morrow, put a piece of gold into his hand. Well, said Baba Mustafa, which was his name, and who was a merry old fellow, looking at the gold, though it was hardly daylight, and seeing what it was, this is good, Hansel. What must I do for it? I am ready. Baba Mustafa, said Morgiana, you must take with you your sewing tackle, and go with me. "'But I must tell you, I shall blindfold you when you come to such a place.' "'Baba Mustafa seemed to hesitate a little at these words. "'Oh, oh!' replied he. "'You would have me do something against my conscience or against my honour? "'God forbid,' said Morgiana, putting another piece of gold into his hand, "'that I should ask anything that is contrary to your honour. "'Only come along with me, and fear nothing.' Baba Mustafa went with Morgiana, who, after she had bound his eyes with a handkerchief at the place she had mentioned, 
conveyed him to her deceased master's house, and never unloosed his eyes till he had entered the room where she had put the corpse together. "'Baba Mustafa,' said she, "'you must make haste and sew these quarters together, and when you have done, I will give you another piece of gold.' After Baba Mustafa had finished his task, she blindfolded him again, gave him the third piece of gold as she had promised, and recommending secrecy to him, carried him back to the place where she first bound his eyes, pulled off the bandage, and let him go home, but watched him that he returned towards his stall, till he was quite out of sight, for fear he should have the curiosity to return and dodge her. She then went home. By the time Morgiana had warmed some water to wash the body, Ali Baba came with incense to embalm it, after which it was sewn up in a winding sheet. Not long after, the joiner, according to Ali Baba's orders, brought the beer, which Morgiana received at the door, and helped Ali Baba to put the body into it, when she went to the mosque to inform the imam that they were ready. The people of the mosque, whose business it was to wash the dead, offered to perform their duty, but she told them that it was done already. Morgiana had scarcely got home before the imam and the other ministers of the mosque arrived. Four neighbours carried the corpse on their shoulders to the burying ground, following the imam, who recited some prayers. Morgiana, as a slave to the deceased, followed the corpse weeping, beating her breast, and tearing her hair. And Ali Baba came after with some neighbours, who often relieved the others in carrying the corpse to the burying ground. Cassim's wife stayed at home mourning, uttering lamentable cries with the women of the neighbourhood, who came according to custom during the funeral, and joining their lamentations with hers, filled the quarter far and near with sorrow. In this manner Cassim's melancholy death was concealed, and hushed up between Ali Baba, his wife, Cassim's widow, and Morgiana with so much contrivance that nobody in the city had the least knowledge or suspicion of the cause of it. Three or four days after the funeral, Ali Baba removed his few goods openly to the widow's home, but the money he had taken from the robbers he conveyed thither by night. Soon after, the marriage with his sister-in-law was published, and as these marriages are common, nobody was surprised. As for Cassim's warehouse, Ali Baba gave it to his own eldest son, promising that if he managed it well, he would soon give him a fortune to marry very advantageously according to his situation. Let us now leave Ali Baba to enjoy the beginning of his good fortune, and return to the forty robbers. They came again at the appointed time to visit their retreat in the forest, but great was their surprise to find Cassim's body taken away, with some of their bags of gold. "'We are certainly discovered,' said the captain, "'and if we do not speedily apply some remedy, shall gradually lose all the riches which our ancestors and ourselves have, with so much pains and danger, been so many years amassing together. All that we can think of the loss which we have sustained is that the thief whom we surprised, had the secret of opening the door, and we came luckily as he was coming out. But his body being removed, and with it some of our money, plainly shows that he had an accomplice, and, as it is likely that there were but two who had discovered our secret, and one has been caught, we must look narrowly after the other. What say you, my lads?' All the robbers thought the captain's proposal so advisable that they unanimously approved of it, and agreed that they must lay all other enterprises aside to follow this closely, and not give it up till they had succeeded. "'I expected no less,' said the captain, "'from your fidelity to our cause. But, first of all, one of you who is bold, artful, and enterprising must go into the town disguised as a traveller and a stranger, to try if he can hear any talk of the strange death of the man whom we have killed, as he deserved, and endeavour to find out who he was and where he lived. This is a matter of the first importance for us to ascertain, 
that we may do nothing which we may have reason to repent of by discovering ourselves in a country where we have lived so long unknown and where we have so much reason to continue but to warn him who shall take upon himself this commission and to prevent our being deceived by his giving us a false report which may be the cause of our ruin i ask you all if you do not think that in case of treachery or even error of judgment he should suffer death without waiting for the suffrages of his companions one of the robbers started up and said i submit to this condition and think it an honour to expose my life by taking the commission upon me but remember at least if i do not succeed that i neither wanted courage nor good will to serve the troop after this robber had received great commendations from the captain and his comrades he disguised himself so that nobody would take him for what he was and taking his leave of the troop that night went into the town just at daybreak and walked up and down till accidentally he came to baba mustapha's stall which was always open before any of the shops baba mustapha was seated with an awl in his hand just going to work the robber saluted him bidding him good morrow and perceiving that he was old said honest man you begin to work very early is it possible that one of your age can see so well i question even if it were somewhat lighter whether you could see to stitch certainly replied baba mustapha you must be a stranger and do not know me for old as i am i have extraordinary good eyes and you will not doubt it when i tell you that i sewed a dead body together in a place where i had not so much light as i have now the robber was overjoyed to think that he had addressed himself at his first coming into the town to a man who in all probability could give him the intelligence he wanted a dead body replied he with affected amazement to make him explain himself what could you sew up a dead body for you mean you sewed up his winding sheet no no answered baba mustapha i perceive your meaning you want to have me speak out but you shall know no more the robber wanted no farther assurance to be persuaded that he had discovered what he sought he pulled out a piece of gold and putting it into baba mustapha's hand said to him i do not want to learn your secret though i can assure you i would not divulge it if you trusted me with it the only thing which i desire of you is to do me the favour to show me the house where you stitched up the dead body if i were disposed to do you that favour replied baba mustapha holding the money in his hand ready to return it i assure you i cannot and you may believe me on my word i was taken to a certain place where i was blinded i was then led to the house and afterwards brought back again in the same manner you see therefore the impossibility of my doing what you desire well said the robber you may however remember a little of the way that you were led blindfolded come let me blind your eyes at the same place we will walk together perhaps you may recognize some part and as everybody ought to be paid for their trouble there is another piece of gold for you gratify me in what i ask you so saying he put another piece of gold into his hand the two pieces of gold were great temptations to baba mustapha he looked at them a long time in his hand without saying a word thinking with himself what he should do but at last he pulled out his purse and put them in i cannot assure you said he to the robber that i can remember the way exactly but since you desire i will try what i can do at these words baba mustapha rose up to the great joy of the robber and without shutting his shop where he had nothing valuable to lose he led the robber to the place where morgiana had bound his eyes it was here said baba mustapha i was blindfolded and i turned as you see me the robber who had his handkerchief ready tied it over his eyes walked by him till he stopped partly leading and partly guided by him i think said baba mustapha i went no farther 
and he had now stopped directly at Cassim's house, where Ali Baba then lived. The thief, before he pulled off the band, marked the door with a piece of chalk, which he had ready in his hand, and then asked him if he knew whose house that was, to which Baba Mustapha replied that as he did not live in that neighbourhood, he could not tell. The robber, finding he could discover no more from Baba Mustapha, thanked him for the trouble he had taken, and left him to go back to his stall, while he returned to the forest, persuaded that he should be very well received. A little after the robber and Baba Mustapha had parted, Morgiana went out of Ali Baba's house upon some errand, and upon her return, seeing the mark the robber had made, stopped to observe it. "'What can be the meaning of this mark?' said she to herself. "'Somebody intends my master no good. However, with whatever intention it was done, it is advisable to guard against the worst.' Accordingly, she fetched a piece of chalk, and marked two or three doors on each side, in the same manner, without saying a word to her master or mistress. In the meantime, the thief rejoined his troop in the forest, and recounted to them his success, expatiating upon his good fortune in meeting so soon with the only person who could inform him of what he wanted to know. All the robbers listened to him with the utmost satisfaction. When the captain, after commenting his diligence, addressed himself to them all, said, "'Comrades, we have no time to lose. Let us set off well armed, without its appearing who we are. But that we may not excite any suspicion, let only one or two go into the town together, and join at our rendezvous, which shall be the great square. In the meantime, our comrade, who brought us the good news, and I, will go and find out the house, that we may consult what had best be done. This speech and plan were approved of by all, and they were soon ready. They filed off in parties of two each, after some interval of time, and got into the town without being in the least suspected. The captain, and he who had visited the town in the morning as spy, came in the last. He led the captain into the street where he had marked Ali Baba's residence, and when they came to the first of the houses which Morgiana had marked, he pointed it out. But the captain observed that the next door was chalked in the same manner, and in the same place, and showing it to his guide, asked him which house it was, that or the first. The guide was so confounded that he knew not what answer to make, but still more puzzled when he and the captain saw five or six houses similarly marked. He assured the captain with an oath that he had marked but one, and could not tell who had chalked the rest, so that he could not distinguish the house which the cobbler had stopped at. The captain, finding that their design had proved abortive, went directly to the place of rendezvous, and told the first of his troops whom he met that they had lost their labour and must return to their cave. He himself set them the example, and they all returned as they had come. When the troop was all got together, the captain told them the reason of their returning, and presently the conductor was declared by all worthy of death. He condemned himself, acknowledging that he ought to have taken better precaution, and prepared to receive the stroke from him who was appointed to cut off his head. But as the safety of the troop required that an injury should not go unpunished, another of the gang, who promised himself that he should succeed better, presented himself, and his offer being accepted, he went and corrupted Baba Mustapha as the other had done, and being shown the house, marked it in a place more remote from sight, with red chalk. Not long after, Morgiana, whose eyes nothing could escape, went out, and seeing the red chalk, and arguing with herself as she had done before, marked the other neighbours' houses in the same place and manner. The robber, at his return to his company, valued himself much on the precaution he had taken, which he looked upon as an infallible way of distinguishing Ali Baba's house from the others, and the captain and all of them thought it must succeed. 
they conveyed themselves into the town with the same precaution as before but when the robber and his captain came to the street they found the same difficulty at which the captain was enraged and the robber in as great confusion as his predecessor thus the captain and his troop were forced to retire a second time and much more dissatisfied while the robber who had been the author of the mistake underwent the same punishment which he willingly submitted to the captain having lost two brave fellows of his troop was afraid of diminishing it too much by pursuing this plan to get information of the residence of their plunderer he found by their example that their heads were not so good as their hands on such occasions and therefore resolved to take upon himself the important commission accordingly he went and addressed himself to baba mustapha who did him the same service he had done to the other robbers he did not set any particular mark on the house but examined and observed it so carefully by passing often by it that it was impossible for him to mistake it the captain well satisfied with his attempt and informed of what he wanted to know returned to the forest and when he came into the cave where the troop waited for him said now comrades nothing can prevent our full revenge as i am certain of the house and in my way hither i have thought how to put it into execution but if any one can form a better expedient let him communicate it he then told them his contrivance and as they approved of it ordered them to go into the villages about and buy nineteen mules with thirty-eight large leather jars one full of oil and the others empty in two or three days time the robbers had purchased the mules and jars and as the mouths of the jars were rather too narrow for his purpose the captain caused them to be widened and after having put one of his men into each with the weapons which he thought fit leaving open the seam which had been undone to leave them room to breathe he rubbed the jars on the outside with oil from the full vessel things being thus prepared when the nineteen mules were loaded with thirty-seven robbers in jars and the jar of oil the captain as their driver set out with them and reached the town by the dusk of the evening as he had intended he led them through the streets till he came to ali baba's at whose door he designed to have knocked but was prevented by his sitting there after supper to take a little fresh air he stopped the mules addressed himself to him and said i have brought some oil a great way to sell at to-morrow's market and it is now so late that i do not know where to lodge if i should not be troublesome to you do me the favour to let me pass the night with you and i shall be very much obliged by your hospitality though ali baba had seen the captain of the robbers in the forest and had heard him speak it was impossible to know him in the disguise of an oil merchant he told him he should be welcome and immediately opened his gates for the mules to go into the yard at the same time he called to a slave and ordered him when the mules were unloaded not only to put them into the stable but to give them fodder and then went to morgiana to bid her get a good supper for his guest he did more to make his guest as welcome as possible when he saw the captain had unloaded his mules and that they were put into the stables as he had ordered and he was looking for a place to pass the night in the air he brought him into a hall where he received his company telling him he would not suffer him to be in the court the captain excused himself on pretence of not being troublesome but really to have room to execute his design and it was not till after the most pressing importunity that he yielded ali baba not content to keep company with the man who had a design on his life till supper was ready continued talking with him till it was ended and repeating his offer of service the captain rose up at the same time with his host and while ali baba went to speak to morgiana he withdrew into the yard under pretence of looking at his mules ali baba after charging morgiana afresh to take care of his guest said to her 
"'Tomorrow morning I design to go to the bath before day. "'Take care my bathing linen be ready. "'Give them to Abdullah, which was the slave's name, "'and make me some good broth against I return.' After this he went to bed. In the meantime, the captain of the robbers went from the stable to give his people orders what to do, and beginning at the first jar, and so on to the last, said to each man, As soon as I throw some stones out of the chamber window where I lie, do not fail to cut the jar open with the knife you have about you for the purpose, and come out, and I will immediately join you. After this he returned into the house, when Morgiana, taking up a light, conducted him to his chamber, where she left him, and he, to avoid any suspicion, put the light out soon after, and laid himself down in his clothes, that he might be the more ready to rise. Morgiana, remembering Ali Baba's orders, got his bathing linen ready, and ordered Abdullah to set on the pot for the broth. But while she was preparing it, the lamp went out, and there was no more oil in the house, nor any candles. What to do she did not know, for the broth must be made. Abdullah, seeing her very uneasy, said, Do not fret and tease yourself, but go into the yard, and take some oil out of one of the jars. Morgiana thanked Abdullah for his advice, took the oil pot, and went into the yard, when, as she came nigh the first jar, the robber within said softly, "'Is it time?' Though the robber spoke low, Morgiana was struck with the voice the more, because the captain, when he unloaded the mules, had taken the lids off this and all the other jars to give air to his men, who were ill enough at their ease, almost wanting room to breathe. As much surprised as Morgiana naturally was at finding a man in a jar instead of the oil she wanted, Many would have made such a noise as to have given an alarm, which would have been attended with fatal consequences. Whereas Morgiana, comprehending immediately the importance of keeping silence, from the danger Ali Baba, his family, and herself were in, and the necessity of applying a speedy remedy without noise, conceived at once the means, and collecting herself without showing the least emotions, answered, Not yet! But presently, she went in this manner to all the jars, giving the same answer, till she came to the jar of oil. By this means, Morgiana found that her master, Ali Baba, who thought that he had entertained an oil merchant, had admitted thirty-eight robbers into his house, regarding this pretended merchant as their captain. She made what haste she could to fill her oil pot, and returned into her kitchen, where, as soon as she had lighted her lamp, she took a great kettle, went again to the oil jar, filled the kettle, set it on a large wood fire, and, as soon as it boiled, went and poured enough into every jar to stifle and destroy the robber within. When this action, worthy of the courage of Morgiana, was executed without any noise, as she had projected, she returned into the kitchen with the empty kettle, and having put out the great fire she had made to boil the oil, and leaving just enough to make the broth, put out the lamp also, and remained silent, resolving not to go to rest till she had observed what might follow through a window of the kitchen which opened into the yard. End of section 30《The Arabian Nights Entertainments》Volume Three, translated by Jonathan Scott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gillian Hendry. The story of Ali Baba and the forty robbers destroyed by a slave, Part Three. She had not waited long before the captain of the robbers got up, opened the window, and finding no light and hearing no noise or any one stirring in the house gave the appointed signal by throwing little stones, several of which hit the jars, as he doubted not by the sound they gave. He then listened, but not hearing or perceiving anything whereby he could judge that his companions stirred, 
he began to grow very uneasy, threw stones again a second and also a third time, and could not comprehend the reason that none of them should answer his signal. Much alarmed, he went softly down into the yard, and going to the first jar, whilst asking the robber whom he thought alive, if he was in readiness, smelt the hot boiled oil, which sent forth a steam out of the jar. Hence he suspected that his plot to murder Ali Baba and plunder his house was discovered. Examining all the jars one after another, he found that all his gang were dead, and by the oil he missed out of the last jar, guessed the means and manner of their death. Enraged to despair at having failed in his design, he forced the lock of a door that led from the yard to the garden, and climbing over the walls, made his escape. When Morgiana heard no noise, and found, after waiting some time, that the captain did not return, she concluded that he had chosen rather to make his escape by the garden than the street door, which was double locked. Satisfied and pleased to have succeeded so well in saving her master and family, she went to bed. Ali Baba rose before day, and, followed by his slave, went to the baths, entirely ignorant of the important event which had happened at home, for Morgiana had not thought it safe to wake him before, for fear of losing her opportunity, and after her successful exploit she thought it needless to disturb him. When he returned from the baths, the sun was risen. He was very much surprised to see the oil jars, and that the merchant was not gone with the mules. He asked Morgiana, who opened the door, and had let all things stand as they were, that he might see them, the reason of it. "'My good master,' answered she, "'God preserve you and all your family. You will be better informed of what you wish to know when you have seen what I have to show you, if you will but give yourself the trouble to follow me.' As soon as Morgiana had shut the door, Ali Baba followed her when she requested him to look into the first jar and see if there was any oil. Ali Baba did so, and seeing a man, started back in alarm and cried out. Do not be afraid, said Morgiana. The man you see there can neither do you nor anybody else any harm. He is dead. Ah, Morgiana, said Ali Baba, what is it you show me? Explain yourself. I will, replied Morgiana. Moderate your astonishment, and do not excite the curiosity of your neighbours, for it is of great importance to keep this affair secret. Look into all the other jars. Ali Baba examined all the other jars one after another, and when he came to that which had the oil in, found it prodigiously sunk, and stood for some time motionless, sometimes looking at the jars, and sometimes at Morgiana, without saying a word, so great was his surprise. At last, when he had recovered himself, he said, "'And what is become of the merchant?' "'Merchant,' answered she, "'he is as much one as I am. I will tell you who he is, and what is become of him. But you had better hear my story in your own chamber, for it is time for your health that you had your broth after your bathing.' While Ali Baba retired to his chamber, Morgiana went into the kitchen to fetch the broth. But before he would drink it, he first entreated her to satisfy his impatience and tell him what had happened, with all the circumstances, and she obeyed him. "'Last night, sir,' said she, "'when you were gone to bed, I got your bathing linens ready and gave them to Abdullah. Afterwards I set on the pot for the broth, but as I was preparing the materials, the lamp for want of oil went out.' and as there was not a drop more in the house, I looked for a candle, but could not find one. Abdullah, seeing me vexed, put me in mind of the jars of oil which stood in the yard. I took the oil pot, went directly to the jar which stood nearest to me, and when I came to it, heard a voice within, saying, Is it time? Without being dismayed, and comprehending immediately the malicious intention of the pretended oil merchant, I answered, not yet, but presently. I then went to the next, when another voice asked me the same question, and I returned the same answer. 
and so on till I came to the last, which I found full of oil, with which I filled my pot. When I considered that there were thirty-seven robbers in the yard, who only waited for a signal to be given by the captain, whom you took to be an oil merchant, and entertained so handsomely, I thought there was no time to be lost. I carried my pot of oil into the kitchen, lighted the lamp, afterwards took the biggest kettle I had, went and filled it full of oil, set it on the fire to boil, and then poured as much into each jar as was sufficient to prevent them from executing the pernicious design they had meditated. After this I retired into the kitchen and put out the lamp, but before I went to bed, waited at the window to know what measures the pretended merchant would take. After I had watched some time for the signal, he threw some stones out of the window against the jars, but neither hearing nor perceiving anybody stirring, after throwing three times, he came down, when I saw him go to every jar, after which, through the darkness of the night, I lost sight of him. I waited some time longer, and finding that he did not return, doubted not but that, seeing he had missed his aim, he had made his escape over the walls of the garden. Persuaded that the house was now safe, I went to bed. This, said Morgiana, is the account you asked of me, and I am convinced it is the consequence of what I observed some days ago, but did not think fit to acquaint you with. For when I came in one morning early, I found our street door marked with white chalk, and the next morning with red, upon which both times, without knowing what was the intention of those chalks, I marked two or three neighbours' doors on each side in the same manner. If you reflect on this, and what has since happened, you will find it to be a plot of the robbers of the forest, of whose gang there are two wanting, and now they are reduced to three. All this shows that they had sworn your destruction, and it is proper you should be upon your guard while there is one of them alive. For my part, I shall neglect nothing necessary to your preservation, as I am in duty bound. When Morgiana had left off speaking, Ali Baba was so sensible of the great service she had done him, that he said to her, I will not die without rewarding you as you deserve. I owe my life to you, and for the first token of my acknowledgement, give you your liberty from this moment, till I can complete your recompense as I intend. I am persuaded with you that the forty robbers have laid snares for my destruction. God, by your means, has delivered me from them as yet, and I hope will continue to preserve me from their wicked designs, and by averting the danger which threatened me, will deliver the world from their persecution and their cursed race. All that we have to do is to bury the bodies of these pests of mankind immediately, and with all the secrecy imaginable, that nobody may suspect what is become of them. But that labour Abdullah and I will undertake. Ali Baba's garden was very long, and shaded at the farther end by a great number of large trees. Under these he and the slave dug a trench, long and wide enough to hold all the robbers, and as the earth was light they were not long in doing it. Afterwards they lifted the bodies out of the jars, took away their weapons, carried them to the end of the garden, laid them in the trench, and levelled the ground again. When this was done, Ali Baba hid the jars and weapons, and as he had no occasion for the mules, he sent them at different times to be sold in the market by his slave. While Ali Baba took these measures to prevent the public from knowing how he came by his riches in so short a time, the captain of the forty robbers returned to the forest with inconceivable mortification and in his agitation, or rather confusion, at his ill success, so contrary to what he had promised himself, entered the cave, not being able, all the way from the town, to come to any resolution how to revenge himself of Ali Baba. The loneliness of the gloomy cavern became frightful to him. "'Where are you, my brave lads?' cried he. "'Old companions of my watchings, in roads and labour. "'What can I do without you?' Did I collect you only to lose you by so base a fate, and so unworthy of your courage? Had you died with your sabres in your hands like brave men, my regret had been less. When shall I enlist so gallant a troop again? And if I could, 
can I undertake it without exposing so much gold and treasure to him who hath already enriched himself out of it? I cannot. I ought not to think of it, before I have taken away his life. I will undertake that alone which I could not accomplish with your powerful assistance, and when I have taken measures to secure this treasure from being pillaged, I will provide for it new masters and successors after me, who shall preserve and augment it to all posterity. This resolution being taken, he was not at a loss how to execute his purpose, but, easy in his mind and full of hopes, slept all that night very quietly. When he awoke early next morning, he dressed himself, agreeably to the project he had formed, went to the town, and took a lodging in a khan. As he expected what had happened at Ali Baba's might make a great noise, he asked his host what news there was in the city, upon which the innkeeper told him a great many circumstances which did not concern him in the least. He judged by this that the reason why Ali Baba kept his affairs so secret was for fear people should know where the treasure lay, and because he knew his life would be sought on account of it. This urged him the more to neglect nothing to rid himself of so cautious an enemy. The captain now assumed the character of a merchant, and conveyed gradually a great many sorts of rich stuffs and fine linen to his lodging from the cavern, but with all the necessary precautions imaginable to conceal the place whence he brought them, in order to dispose of the merchandises, when he had amassed them together, he took a warehouse, which happened to be opposite to Cassim's, which Ali Baba's son had occupied since the death of his uncle. He took the name of Khawja Hussein, and as a newcomer, was, according to custom, extremely civil and complacent to all the merchants his neighbours. Ali Baba's son was from his vicinity one of the first to converse with Khawja Hussein who strove to cultivate his friendship more particularly when, two or three days after he was settled, he recognised Ali Baba, who came to see his son, and stopped to talk with him as he was accustomed to do. When he was gone, the impostor learnt from his son who he was. He increased his assiduities, caressed him in the most engaging manner, made him some small presents, and often asked him to dine and sup with him when he treated him very handsomely. Ali Baba's son did not choose to lie under such obligation to Khawja Hussein without making the like return, but was so much straitened for want of room in his house that he could not entertain him so well as he wished. He therefore acquainted his father Ali Baba with his intention, and told him that it did not look well for him to receive such favours from Khawja Hussein without inviting him in return. Ali Baba, with great pleasure, took the treat upon himself. "'Son,' said he, "'tomorrow being Friday, which is a day that the shops of such great merchants as Khalja Hussein and yourself are shut, get him to take a walk with you. And as you come back, pass by my door and call in. It will look better to have it happen accidentally than if you gave him a formal invitation. I will go and order Morgiana to provide a supper.' The next day, Ali Baba's son and Khawja Hussein met by appointment, took their walk, and, as they returned, Ali Baba's son led Khawja Hussein through the street where his father lived, and when they came to the house, stopped and knocked at the door. "'This, sir,' said he, "'is my father's house, who, from the account I have given him of your friendship, charged me to procure him the honour of your acquaintance.' and I desire you to add this pleasure to those for which I am already indebted to you. Though it was the sole aim of Khalja Hussein to introduce himself into Ali Baba's house, that he might kill him without hazarding his own life or making any noise, yet he excused himself and offered to take his leave. But a slave having opened the door, Ali Baba's son took him obligingly by the hand and in a manner forced him in. Ali Baba received Khawja Hussein with a smiling countenance, and in the most obliging manner he could wish. He thanked him for all the favours he had done his son, adding withal, the obligation was the greater, as he was a young man not much acquainted with the world, and that he might contribute to his information. Khawja Hussein returned the compliment 
by assuring Ali Baba that though his son might not have acquired the experience of older men, he had good sense equal to the experience of many others. After a little more conversation on different subjects, he offered again to take his leave, when Ali Baba, stopping him, said, "'Where are you going, sir, in so much haste? I beg you would do me the honour to sup with me, though what I have to give you is not worth your acceptance. But such as it is, I hope you will accept it as heartily as I give it.' "'Sir,' replied Khalja Hussein, "'I am thoroughly persuaded of your good will, and if I ask the favour of you not to take it ill that I do not accept your obliging invitation, I beg of you to believe that it does not proceed from any slight or intention to affront, but from a reason which you would approve if you knew it.' "'And what may that reason be, sir?' replied Ali Baba, "'if I may be so bold as to ask you.' It is, answered Khaja Hussein, that I can eat no victuals that have any salt in them. Therefore, judge how I should feel at your table. If that is the only reason, said Ali Baba, it ought not to deprive me of the honour of your company at supper. For, in the first place, there is no salt ever put into my bread, and as to the meat we shall have to-night, I promise you there shall be none in that." therefore you must do me the favour to stay. I will return immediately. Ali Baba went into the kitchen and ordered Morgiana to put no salt to the meat that was to be dressed that night, and to make quickly two or three ragouts beside what he had ordered, but be sure to put no salt in them. Morgiana, who was always ready to obey her master, could not help this time seeming somewhat dissatisfied at his strange order. "'Who is this difficult man?' said she, "'who eats no salt with his meat. "'Your supper will be spoiled if I keep it back so long.' "'Do not be angry, Morgiana,' replied Ali Baba. "'He is an honest man. "'Therefore do as I bid you.' "'Morgiana obeyed, though with no little reluctance, "'and had a curiosity to see this man who ate no salt. "'To this end, when she had finished what she had to do in the kitchen,' She helped Abdullah to carry up the dishes, and, looking at Khalja Hussein, knew him at first sight, notwithstanding his disguise, to be the captain of the robbers, and examining him very carefully, perceived that he had a dagger under his garment. "'I am not in the least amazed,' said she to herself, "'that this wicked wretch, who is my master's greatest enemy, would eat no salt with him.' since he intends to assassinate him, but I will prevent him. Morgiana, while they were eating, made the necessary preparations for executing one of the boldest acts ever meditated, and had just determined, when Abdullah came for the dessert of fruit, which she carried up. And as soon as Abdullah had taken the meat away, set it upon the table, after that she placed three glasses by Ali Baba, and going out, took Abdullah with her to sup, and to give Ali Baba the more liberty of conversation with his guest. Khalja Hussein, or rather the captain of the robbers, thought he had now a favourable opportunity of being revenged on Ali Baba. "'I will,' said he to himself, "'make the father and son both drunk. The son, whose life I intend to spare, will not be able to prevent my stabbing his father to the heart.' and while the slaves are at supper or asleep in the kitchen, I can make my escape over the gardens as before. Instead of going to supper, Morgiana, who had penetrated the intentions of the counterfeit Khalja Hussein, would not give him time to put his villainous design into execution, but dressed herself neatly with a suitable headdress like a dancer, girded her waist with a silver gilt girdle, to which there hung a poniard, with a hilt and guard of the same metal, and put a handsome mask on her face. When she had thus disguised herself, she said to Abdullah, "'Take your tabor, and let us go and divert our master and his son's guest, as we do sometimes when he is alone.' Abdullah took his tabor, and played all the way into the hall before Morgiana, who, when she came to the door, made a low obeisance, with a deliberate air, in order to draw attention and by way of asking leave to exhibit her skill. Abdullah, 
seeing that his master had a mind to say something, left off playing. "'Come in, Morgiana,' said Ali Baba, "'and let Khalja Hussein see what you can do, "'that he may tell us what he thinks of you.' "'But, sir,' said he, turning towards his guest, "'do not think that I put myself to any expense "'to give you this diversion, "'since these are my slave and my cook and housekeeper, "'and I hope you will not find the entertainment they give us disagreeable.' Khalja Hussein, who did not expect this diversion after supper, began to fear he should not be able to improve the opportunity he thought he had found, but hoped, if he now missed his aim, to secure it another time, by keeping up a friendly correspondence with the father and son. Therefore, though he could have wished Ali Baba would have declined the dance, he pretended to be obliged to him for it and had the complaisance to express his satisfaction at what he saw pleased his host. As soon as Abdullah saw that Ali Baba and Khawja Hussein had done talking, he began to play on the tabor, and accompanied it with an air, to which Morgiana, who was an excellent performer, danced in such a manner as would have created admiration in any other company besides that before which she now exhibited, among whom, perhaps, none but the false Khawja Hussein was in the least attentive to her, the rest having seen her so frequently. After she had danced several dances with equal propriety and grace, she drew the poniard, and holding it in her hand, began a dance, in which she outdid herself by the many different figures, light movements, and the surprising leaps and wonderful exertions with which she accompanied it. Sometimes she presented the poniard to one's breast, sometimes to another's, and oftentimes seeming to strike her own. At last, as if she was out of breath, she snatched the tabor from Abdullah with her left hand, and holding the dagger in her right, presented the other side of the tabor, after the manner of those who get a livelihood by dancing, and solicit the liberality of the spectators. Ali Baba put a piece of gold into the tabor, as did also his son, and Khalja Hussein, seeing that she was coming to him, had pulled his purse out of his bosom to make her a present, but while he was putting his hand into it, Morgiana, with a courage and resolution worthy of herself, plunged the poniard into his heart. Ali Baba and his son, shocked at this action, cried out aloud. "'Unhappy wretch!' exclaimed Ali Baba. "'What have you done to ruin me and my family?' "'It was to preserve, not to ruin you,' answered Morgiana. "'For see here,' continued she, opening the pretended Khawja Hussein's garment and showing the dagger. "'What an enemy you had entertained! Look well at him, and you will find him to be both the fictitious oil merchant and the captain of the gang of forty robbers. Remember, too, that he would eat no salt with you, and what would you have more to persuade you of his wicked design?' Before I saw him, I suspected him as soon as you told me you had such a guest. I knew him, and you now find that my suspicion was not groundless. Ali Baba, who immediately felt the new obligation he had to Morgiana for saving his life a second time, embraced her. Morgiana, said he, I gave you your liberty, and then promised you that my gratitude should not stop there but that I would soon give you higher proofs of its sincerity, which I now do by making you my daughter-in-law. Then, addressing himself to his son, he said, I believe you, son, to be so dutiful a child that you will not refuse Morgiana for your wife. You see that Khalja Hussein sought your friendship with a treacherous design to take away my life, and if he had succeeded, there is no doubt, but he would have sacrificed you also to his revenge. Consider that by marrying Morgiana, you marry the preserver of my family and your own. The son, far from showing any dislike, readily consented to the marriage, not only because he would not disobey his father, but also because it was agreeable to his inclination. After this, they thought of burying the captain of the robbers with his comrades, and did it so privately that nobody discovered their bones till many years after, when no one had any concern in the publication of this remarkable history. A few days afterwards, Ali Baba celebrated the nuptials of his son and Morgiana 
with great solemnity, a sumptuous feast, and the usual dancing and spectacles, and had the satisfaction to see that his friends and neighbours whom he invited had no knowledge of the true motives of the marriage, but that those who were not unacquainted with Morgiana's good qualities commended his generosity and goodness of heart. Ali Baba forbore, after this marriage, from going again to the robber's cave, as he had done from the time he had brought away his brother Cassim's mangled remains, for fear of being surprised. He kept away after the death of the thirty-seven robbers and their captain, supposing the other two, whom he could get no account of, might be alive. At the year's end, when he found they had not made any attempt to disturb him, he had the curiosity to make another journey, taking the necessary precautions for his safety. He mounted his horse, and when he came to the cave, and saw no footsteps of men or horses, looked upon it as a good sign. He alighted, tied his horse to a tree, then, approaching the entrance, and pronouncing the words, Open Sesame, the door opened. He entered the cavern, and, by the condition he found things in, judged that nobody had been there since the false Khaja Hussein, when he had fetched the goods for his shop, that the gang of forty robbers was completely destroyed, and no longer doubted that he was the only person in the world who had the secret of opening the cave, so that all the treasure was at his sole disposal. Having brought with him a wallet, he put into it as much gold as his horse would carry, and returned to town. Afterwards, Ali Baba carried his son to the cave, taught him the secret, which they handed down to their posterity, who, using their good fortune with moderation, lived in great honour and splendour. End of section 31 End of the story of Ali Baba